I'm at the Sony Kando event. It's uh, the second day, chilly, beautiful blue sky. God, California weather is really something. And I'm honored to be sitting here with Colby Brown. We're gonna talk a little bit about landscape photography and how Colby does his work and where he's been and some of his stories. And particularly, once again, we're gonna focus a little bit on the hardware, but not overwhelm it. Uh, because Colby is obviously a Sony user and talk a little bit about why. So let's first off talk about your interest in photography and what got you going specifically to the point where you're doing what you're doing now, which are just some amazing landscapes and projects from all over the world. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I got into, well, I got into photography because I had a love of travel. Like I don't have like a nostalgic story where like my father handed me a camera when I was seven and that's what I always wanted yeah. to do. Um, I instead got bit by the travel bug and essentially just always wanted to be back out on the road. And early on in my life, I was single and nomadic and just wanted to keep traveling. And so at that stage, which was around 2006, uh, when I started my first photography company, it was really just the notion that I felt that photography was going to be the artistic medium that potentially at the time would allow me to keep traveling and to stay on the road. And it just so happened that it turned into a passion and turned into something that I was uh, pretty good at and uh, was able to make a living out of. So it was kind of very serendipitous where it, it kind of came to be rather than uh, something more nostalgic. Well, a lot of people have a hard time making a living out of it. What did you find early on as a trick to, to make the living, specifically with the kind of work you were doing? Well, I, I, I feel that the industry has changed, as you know, a lot in the last 15 so, yeah. years. And I think that there was a lot of writing on the wall of the changes that were coming about just right as social media really kind of jumped onto the frame. And you had, you had stock and periodical work that were kind of, I would, kind of say drying up or changing and shifting and evolving. And social media has been a, a big part of my growth over the years. I mean, I started my first photography company in 2006, a year after Zuckerberg started Facebook. And each of the different platforms that have come out since, I've been very fortunate to be part of that initial wave yeah, of stages, interest and yeah, momentum. Right. And that has kind of propelled me forward to give me uh, you know, my own marketing arm in a day and age, or at least at the time, where that wasn't, that, that was just beginning. And so we were kind of writing our own pathways and figuring out new ways to, to market our own products or services or to realize what was happening in the industry and kind of change and shift and, and evolve our business models for what was standard practice 10 years ago to what needed to be more dynamic. So you had photographers that just shot still photography that all of a sudden maybe needed to do video work as well, or people that did you know, writing and photography that needed to diversify. And so having the ability to have our own marketing arm allowed us to create our own niches. And that has, you know, that, you know, good luck, a little bit of stubbornness has kind of allowed me to, to be where I am today. Well, you're, you're quite fortunate because um, it's so different and so difficult to, to find a way to make a living today. I, I find uh, a lot of really talented uh, fine art landscape photographers are struggling. Uh, you know, they're trying to make and sell prints and it's just not working these days. A lot of it is because uh, customers and end users can go out and purchase a camera, go out and visit the same spot and take a picture that you know is theirs and they feel is just as good. And uh, many of them are trying to diversify, doing workshops and and other things. And it's 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 tough. But I do believe that you know, as you said, you know, there's a lot of perseverance and other things that go along with it. But one of the things that I see more than anything else, um, and you know, having a website and knowing a lot about this whole uh, media thing, is that uh, YouTube, Instagram, and the social media kind of thing, which a lot of people have a difficult time grabbing hold of it, is a major importance in success. How does that play with you? How many likes and, or followers do you have on Instagram? So, you so on Instagram, well, between my main my main page and then also I, I have over the years accumulated or either purchased or, or bought up a couple of the, the other hub pages, um, I have collectively over 500,000. 500, and that gives me interaction rates that typically mm -hmm. range from um, usually five to 10,000 interactions per post. And then you have stories that you usually multiply that by about two per Instagram story. Right now, Instagram's kind of the hot spot, but you know, there's still value out of things in Facebook, uh, which gives you a little bit more uh, opportunities with um, promotions and ad purchases and things like that, depending on the products or services that you're trying to offer. So I find that social media as a whole, I mean, social media in general, I feel is very finicky and also quite superficial, to be honest. Um, but I think through that, there are a lot of potential for engaging conversations. And, and that's how I approach social media. And that's how where I think a lot of creatives 
take a misstep. They think that social media is purely just a marketing arm uh, and, and period, and that's it. For me, I think I don't look at it, I don't look at followers or interaction or likes from a monetary standpoint. I look at it as potential engagements, potential conversations where I have, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people that reach out to me constantly through messages, through the posts that I put out there. And I try to spend time, you know, every single day, every single week, every single month to answer their questions. So you interact. So many people don't. Absolutely. So you're, you're, you're doing a reply to comments sometimes. And does that generate loyalty or does it generate business? How does that? Well, both. I mean, I think I, I, I try to treat, you know, everyone uh -huh. like gold. You know, I try to treat people like, well, we for, when we first got into photography, you know, years ago, like we didn't have a community. We didn't have the ability to ask these questions or to engage with people that we looked up to. And so to me, I think being in a position of, of if you want to call it influence, although I, I don't necessarily like that word, um, I think it's important. There's some sort of responsibility tied to it. And I feel that if you're genuine about those conversations and those engagements and wanting to see people succeed, you wanted to see people get excited about the industry, I think it only elevates everyone else. So it takes a lot of time. It's a lot of energy that gets wrapped into that type of approach to spending the time to engage with everyone that it tries to engage with you. But I feel that it builds up brand loyalty. Uh, I feel that ultimately, you know, people sign up for workshops, people buy prints, people, you know, license images, there's word of mouth advertising that comes from it. But at the end of the day, um, it's also beneficial for the algorithms. I mean, you think about it, all these algorithms are based on the fact of interaction. So the more that people interact with you, the more these algorithms on Facebook, on Instagram, uh -uh. want or, or think that you have this connection with these individuals, and then it will show you more of, their, of your own content to them. And so it, it, it's really a benefit all around if you can invest the time. But still to this day, the number one response I get whenever I do respond to people is, I can't believe you responded. And to me, in this day and age that we're 17 years into the internet and we're, you know, what, 12 years past when Facebook first launched, it's amazing that photographers still aren't taking the time to interact with people that are taking time out of their day to engage with them. Well, I still think it comes back to the old customer service thing. You know, you put that human interaction in there, whether it used to be on the telephone or, you know, even writing letters back in that, that day makes a huge difference in, you know, the way people view you. Well, one of the things that I think you know, I would imagine would be difficult is trying to figure out how to differentiate yourself in this marketplace. For example, you end up with 500,000 followers. They see pictures you take, and let's just maybe take a, a Lofoten example, okay? We know the bridge on Lofoten. Yep, of course. So everybody sees this beautiful little hotel and fishing village sitting there, uh, and, you know, everybody has to go to Lofoten and get that remarkable picture. And, of course, I'm, I'm guilty as charged, okay? <laughs> I don't know too many we people. We all that. are. However, you know, it's like, all right, I got it. And, you know, now I have something everybody else has, and it is really pretty, and part of it is that experience. But, you know, the differentiation right now becomes very hard when every night there's 100 people lined up on that bridge or every morning, you know, shooting that same setup and that same scene. Um, so as all the followers look at your work and they start copying your work and following other examples on Instagram because you know everybody talks about the formula. You've mentioned differentiation by responding, but are there other differentiators that you have to use to stay on the top and stay ahead? Well, I think so. I mean, I think the differentiators are a couple couple pieces. I mean, one, of course, I mean, everyone can take, you know, as, as they say, you can line up, you know, 10 people, 100 people onto that bridge in Hanoi, and everyone's going to come away with something slightly different. Now, it's going to be the same subject matter, yep. but they're going to be different variations. So you have a little bit of discrepancy <laughs> within how you shoot and, of course, how you process and stylize yeah, your sure. images. Um, you know, there are certain photographers out there in the landscape space that have very distinct styles and color palettes. So there's one kind of way to give you a little bit of separation. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of it comes down to branding. I mean, if you look at stuff like myself or other fellow artisans like Chris Ricard and Annie Best, like all of us are creating work at a certain level that I think a lot of people can still aspire to, a lot of people can, can get as well. We don't feel that we're the world's best photographers. We're not trying to be. We're doing something that we love, and I think that brand connection to that work helps separate us as well. Us that take the time and use social media to have this brand identity sure. gives us a little bit of separation. Um, but when it comes to truly capturing something more unique itself in terms of content subjects, 
um, we have to stay ahead of the game. I mean, it's, you know, they're, I was, I was traveling to Iceland in 2011 before, I've, you know, everyone else was hitting there. I've been there 26 times since, and I run a series of workshops every single year. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that hotspot has kind of come and, and arguably gone. Um, and now Lofoten is, is, is a hotspot. Patagonia is a hotspot. You're constantly, as a photographer, trying to look and get ahead of the game, to get ahead of the wave, yes. and to figure out where the next place is going to be. And if you can be the person that sets those trends, you generally reap the rewards before everyone else does. <laughs> and so, off camera. Yeah. I have to share a few of the ones that I've gotten because uh, we started Iceland in 2004 and you know there was dirt paths and dirt roads and now there's rope barriers oh, and yeah. there's buses that show up and there's hot dog stands in the parking lots. It's a different world. <laughs> it really is. It's a different it, world. It's kind of sad and I mean they're a success uh, you know, uh, you know be, be, you know, they're based upon you know their, their own beautiful country but my, my Icelander friends who I have there you know, they're kind of like thanking people and cursing people at the same time. And oh, it's yeah. a difficult position to be in because uh, it's a gorgeous place, but now you can't go there by yourself. I mean, I used to have the black beach to myself shooting icebergs on the beach all morning and not see a soul. Not that and now anymore. a bus comes and some guy jumps on my iceberg like he's surfacing. <laughs> and and so this is a changing world. And I think yeah. what's happening is the world's also become a lot more travel oriented you yeah. know you have a uh, the asian market is you know it's huge, uh, it's huge. It's, i know my antarctica uh, ships that i charter i mean now they're finding they can charter two or three trips a year just filled with you know the asian tourists so you know they're a big part to play in you know we're seeing the southern hemisphere south america those guys are traveling too and you know it, it, hey, I think it's great for the world to do it, yeah. but it's hard for us when we're trying to be photographers. Of course, you know, going to some of these spots. So, you know, we seek out new, new, new spots. And um, well, we have to push the boundaries a little bit. You know, again, I mean, you think about a lot of these locations. I always, I always equate it to what I call the Yellowstone effect. So, Yellowstone National Park uh, is a beautiful park, as I'm sure you're well aware of. Um, it, there's amazing things to see there. Ninety-nine point like. 6% of people that travel there don't venture further than 250 meters from their car. Yep. We're on the walk. So, yeah, 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 exactly. Like that, like from that path, there's <laughs> yep. nothing else. There are, are hundreds, there's like, it's like 950 miles of trails yep. within Yellowstone, but very few people go there. They'll sit there in Lamar Valley and they'll wait to see wolves, you know, two miles away and try to yes. photograph them through binoculars. But if they venture off just a little bit, a lot of all that there stuff's are a lot there. Of treasures. It's just amazing stuff, and I feel that the same way in all these locations. Yeah. And I feel that the people that are willing to put forth that effort to kind of go to these locations to 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 look for something unique, to try to find new ways to capture these iconic spots, are generally rewarded if you want to put forth that effort. Not everyone is, and I think that again begins to allow you to differentiate. If you're willing to hike a couple of miles, if you're willing to backpack in, if you're willing to go to the, some of these remote spots, um, you'll still find the solitude. You just have to work a little bit harder to find it. I hear you. Now, you know, photography for me has always been about the print, you know, the, the end result. Uh, to me, uh, back in the negative days, obviously you didn't have a photograph <laughs> until you had a print, but I'm finding so much today that so many photographers don't ever hold their own picture and their yeah. own print in their hand. But you're, you you print, you believe in that still. Absolutely, I mean, I still think, I, I, I agree. I agree that the extent that the final culmination of an image is typically best reserved for something tangible that you Correct. can hold in whatever medium that may be whether whether it's it's you know printing paper whether it's a you know canvas wood metal um, i think there is something nostalgic about it i think there's something special about it i think it's an art form in itself as you well well, well aware of you know but it is an interesting and changing space because so much more of what we consume these days is digital and there is a piece of that art form i feel being lost um, at the same time you know it, it's it's interesting trying to play devil's advocate and looking at the situation and seeing just how many more people are getting into photography and how the art form is allowing people to capture and connect and share their world or their vision or version of the world with other people. And, and there's like all these other side benefits that come out of it, as well as of course negatives. It's yeah. always, a, a, you know, oh, the yeah. door swings both ways. Um, but it's an interesting space for sure. I mean, I, I enjoy seeing prints. I, I have a handful, not a ton in, in our house. I'm, I'm, I usually collect more art from co countries I travel to rather than just put up my own prints. But I like to mix it up a little yeah. bit here and there. But there, there is something special about it. And I, I do wish that more people spent the time 
to at the bare minimum print some of their favorite stuff because I think it is it's something special about it. It's something special about seeing the whole process, the whole the culmination of your hard work, your effort, both in the field and in the post processing, come together and create something that you can share with something else that you can hand to someone yeah, else, and they can ta they can feel it and the texture um, is pretty special. Yeah, for me it was that that magic of being in the dark room the first time and watching a print magically appear, appear. in developer. And it was like, I remember that day, because I said, I, you know, I didn't say I was hooked, but you know, <laughs> I, I knew I was hooked, you know? Absolutely. And it just became magic, and it, you, know, you just wanted to make prints and so forth. And talking to a, a few of the, you know, the collectives and so forth here, I was surprised at how many don't own printers. Yep. And that just really surprised me, and maybe it's the old part of me and the old guy kind of thing there, but uh, I just want to say that I think, and if specifically all of you out there, if you've never made a print of your work, you know, there's a number of labs. We have uh, labs on uh, Loomis Landscape, like LoomJet and a few others that will do them for you. Or you can buy a printer for less than almost $1,000 today to do 17 by 22 inch prints. It's not that hard. Experience that part of things. To kind of sum things up, I'd like to kind of like just change gears and move over to the hardware side of things and get of geeky. And obviously we're at a Sony event. We talk a lot about mirrorless and the advantages of mirrorless. Mm -hmm. So tell me your journey with your camera systems and why you ended up here. So I started out with, uh, I was a Canon shooter for seven years and, and enjoyed it. I still think they to this day make great cameras. I spent a year also shooting Nikon, which was phenomenal as well. They make great cameras as well. But there was a distinct moment back in, God, it was 2011, 2012, and I was in the Himalayas and I was like day 12 hiking into the Kumu region, which is, uh, you know, quite, quite far in there. It's, yep. it, it's challenging work. And uh, I remember I, I had a porter because um, I'd been there a couple of times, so I didn't need a guide anymore. And I was carrying my own camera gear. He had my, my gear bag. And I just remember, you know, looking at him and looking at myself and being like, why am I carrying 50 pounds of gear? Like, wh why do I have all of this stuff? There has to be a better solution. And literally it was like six months after that, that Sony announced its first line of full frame mirrorless cameras. And that was kind of my holdout at the time. Like the NEX series just wasn't really for me. Um, but that gave me the, the, the reason to initially switch, which was purely about portability. It was purely just like, I, want, I wanted something smaller that had less compromises than what was currently available before that. Um, that allowed me to work in the remote locations that I like to around the world without as much effort. And so the initial draw was, was size, was weight. Um, now as Sony developed its system, as the next generations came out, as the lens lineup developed and build, some of that weight kind of came back. Obviously, yeah, as you know, 2.8, you know, you just can't make those yeah, so it's tiny. physics, man. That's exactly. You, you, you can't get around it. And so, so some of that came back. I, my system is still lighter, but I found that over time, especially with the, the, the current generations, that, you know, for me, Sony has been innovating in a way that for me is special. And what I mean by that is that I find that Sony these days, more so than any other camera manufacturer, are solving questions that I'm not even thinking I need to answer. So every time a generation comes out, there's some sort of feature that I'm like, you know what, I never asked for that but I'm so glad that I have that you now. Know, you didn't know to ask for it. Exactly, you, and, and to me, that's the like definition of innovation. If I'm sitting there and it's, it's, it's something that, that becomes imperative, not imperative, but, but, but becomes super valuable to me as an artist, as a creative, that I can interweave into my system that I don't have to, that, I, that I'm not like begging the manufacturer to make, um, to me, it's kind of cool. It, it, it still creates the surprise and it still shows that there's so many opportunities out there for, for technology to play a role, um, not necessarily the, 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 the biggest role, but certainly a helping hand in how we create what we do. And so now these days, I'm, you know, it, it's, it's no longer necessarily just about portability. It's just about sensor technology. It's about, you know, the autofocus systems. It's about the silent shooting. I was in Africa last year and I was doing work with the Ugandan government and the silverback gorillas as well as um, in Namibia with some of the cheetah conservation efforts. And every single time I was on some of those private game drives capturing the, the stuff that I was documenting for these campaigns, the, the safari guide would constantly be looking back at me. And I was like, what are you, why do you keep looking at me? And he's like, well, are you going to take a photo? And I'm like, I've been taking photos the entire time. I've just been on silent mode. So the animals and the lions and the cheetahs and the gorillas like didn't know what I was doing. So they were just doing their natural thing compared to when you have the loud sound of a shutter going off. It, it, to me, it makes a big difference. And it's little things like that that add up where um, I can't see myself ever going back. No, it's just I, have to, I have to agree. You know, the Sony A9 when it came out was just, 
an amazing camera for me. Now, you talk about how a camera can employ, we were used to, back in the olden days, five frames, six frames a second, thought we were good, and we got up to 10 frames with <laughs> you know, mechanical shutter, but you know that A9 with 20 frames in silent mode, and I use the 100 to 400 uh, G Master. Oh, it's such a good lens. Oh, it's just a, a <laughs> phenomenal, it's my so favorite good. lens. I'm doing a whole video on my favorite lens. Oh, it's so good. And I was in Salvard and we were about to, to land on uh, the shore and there's this bear up there. So we said, we can't land, but we got within three feet of the beach or so. And I'm looking up on top of the hill and there's a bird kind of sanctuary. And watch this Arctic fox jump up and grab a bird. Awesome. And he has his two brothers and they start running down this hill. It must be a hundred foot hill. So I, I'm, I'm the bouncing on the Zodiac, and you, I'm sure you've been there, so you right. know what it's like. And I'm praying for image stabilization, <laughs> and, but I'm watching the little dots, and I'm on auto tracking, and it's following this thing. Yep. And I'm like, and I'm shooting at 20 frames a second. And I, I did turn on that little sound because I find it disorienting. <laughs> I find it so When you don't hear, did it take the photo? <laughs> yeah. Did it take the photo? And it's, it's low enough that you just have a little bit of tactile feedback. Of course, you got the little indicator in the frame. But taking a silent picture is so weird. And then I'm wondering whether the buffer is going to fill up. And they get to the beach. He drops the bird. The one uh, uh, Arctic fox jumps on the other. And it just turned into sand tumbling. And, and I'm just going, oh, my God, if I got this. I, I'll amazing. buy five of these <laughs> And so, I mean, that is an instance, in my opinion, where the innovation makes and changes the opportunity to take great photographs. It changes and, the game. And, it, it really does. I mean, it opens up so many more opportunities for yourself. Yes. I mean, in that same vein, like just the idea of being able to put on a 2x onto the 100 to 400, you know, variable aperture. And yes, you have to shoot at f11, but if you, as long as you have enough light, you're still able to use all those focus points across the entire frame. <laughs> like you can't, you couldn't do that five years ago. They're, they're across the frame, but the ISO and the ability and the dynamic range—it's it's so much fun. It's it it it, it is relieving because it, it's just, it's another thing you don't have to think about. You don't have to worry about, and you can just concentrate on creating exceptional work. And I think that that in itself says something because I think that the industry as a whole has also become a little bit tech obsessed, yes. which is interesting to talk okay. about this since we're talking about tech, but the fact that technology can allow us to not have to fixate or focus on the technology and, and get back to the story, get back to the yeah. composition, get back to creating exceptional work, um, to me is the more important in, in, you know, side of technology. It's not that images have to be technically perfect. You know, if you think of the most amazing images of the last yeah. hundred years, like most of them are, are technically not great. Um, but they have a great story and now we're at a stage where the technology can help us tell a better story because it allows us to not fixate or focus or obsess over the technology. It just plays a supporting role. Well, there are so many people that obsess on technology and I say, you know, go out and take a picture. Yeah. You know, they just want to read the charts and everything. First off, it's fun to take a picture. I call it therapy for me <laughs> to get out there and, and take a picture. But And the story part, which you mentioned, I think is so important. I know photographers that won't stop down below F8. And by the way, here you have an f-stop that you like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that in, in one second. But, you know, they were, oh, if you go to 22, you might get diffraction. If I go to 22, I'll get the picture. Right. You know, I can fix a little bit of the diffraction in some of the software these days. So, you know, don't lose the image because you heard a rule somewhere that says you can't shoot at these f-stops. They put them there for a reason. Right. Yeah. You, the, the, anyone that says there are rules in photography is full of it. Like, there are no rules. Like, get the shot and then worry about it afterwards. Now, you know, have some technical understanding of what you're doing or at least understand or know that there might be some sacrifices. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the shot, you don't have the shot. And F-stops. I, you know, somebody kind of a little birdie came by and said, ask, ask Kobe about his favorite F-stop. So, do you have a favorite F-stop? You know, my, my favorite F-stop range is typically F8 to F16. Now, we, you know, we were just talking about diffraction, like, to be honest, I try not to push it past, past f16, but because I shoot a wide variety of things, my f-stop does vary a little bit. But you know, it, it, it's it's actually not too much of a sexy answer. It's it's more so you know kind of the the f8 to f11 for most of the stuff that that we shoot. But I do quite a bit of photojournalism as well, and you know portraits, you know travel portraits, things like that. In which case, you know wide open is just you know especially with some of the new GM glass, it's it's oh, just, just disturbingly so good. Oh, it's so the nice. the Boca and the you know the 85 GM to me is just it, it's it's something to dream about. So. I, I did a, a story recently, it's on the site, uh, the story of Leica, it's mm -hmm. a, multiple uh, things, and it's funny, their lens designer goes, why we design these lenses so they we're shoot wide open, they're, they're sweet spots wide open, <laughs> wide open, and you know, after that it got me thinking, says, so, you know, I'm an F8 kind of guy, but I started thinking now, especially with the G Master lenses, like you said, 
you know, the, and, the, and the AF is so good, and the IAF is so good. Amazing. You can, like, I shoot with the 85 GM, the G Master, and you shoot that wide open, and do IAF, and it's just like, that eye's out of focus. You know, that's part, part's out of focus, but the one eye that you're focused on is so sharp. Yeah. I mean, literally. And to have that ability then just to dial it back to where, you know, what you want comes in to play, it's just like, once again, it's one of those kind of amazing tools that you sort of didn't ask for, you know. And, but you and, don't want, you don't ever want to give up. No. Absolutely. And that. you just learn it. And, and it, then it just becomes part of your toolbox that you use when you're out there. You know, oh, this shot's, you know, going to be this. And I know I can pull the 22 and recover maybe in capture one. You know, they have some diffraction tools and things that, you know, are there to help too. So anyway. You just wanted to find oh, out. Oh, of course. F8's the spot. F8's the spot. F8's the spot. So you can just F8, you know, the Colby F8 spot. F8 and done. <laughs> you should have a t-shirt made or something. You so do a hashtag. I'm going to start making it trend. Anyway, it's been a real, real pleasure sitting with you. I, can, I know we could probably talk forever, especially if we had a bottle of wine or a couple of beers. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, maybe sometime we'll get a chance to shoot together and, and do a further video about you know how you do things. But... Thank you very much for taking time to sit with us. I really appreciate it. All Colby's information will be listed below. Um, there's some pictures in there. Uh, don't forget, if you like this video, subscribe to us and hit the bell, you know, a little ding dinger thing, and that way we'll notify you. Uh, we'll have this video not only on YouTube, but some more information on our site. Colby, thank you. Always a pleasure, man. man Always a pleasure. Always see you out in the field somewhere. <laughs> Let's do and it. And for all my viewers and readers, Thanks, and I'll see you on the Loomless Landscape.